you know, you know you have a good choir when everyone's sitting down and you're all smiling to yourselves because you're so proud of what you just did. That was just, that was just beautiful. Thank you. Um, this afternoon at 2 o'clock, our cancer choir and our chant choir at the 8 a.m., as well as um, St. Stephen's Episcopal Church, will be here at 2 o'clock singing the O Antiphon service. We invite you to join us for that. It'll be a great time. Pastor Marath and I will be there, and it'll be a lot of fun people singing some wonderful songs and listening to some great music. And I'm excited because I think it's going to be a fantastic way to start this Advent season. So friends, I have a question for you as we begin the sermon here, and it's something that I have had to do recently. When was the last time that you found yourself having to grow to somewhere to find new shampoo or new soap? Now, think back for just a few moments here. Some of us, we've had the same shampoo or soap for most of our lives, but at some point in your life, I'm sure, you've had to make that decision. Do I stick with what I have because I've got not enough left in my bottle even though I turn it upside down and keep adding water to it? Or do I finally try something new? I see commercials. There's these pretty bottles out there, and they talk about natural things. Do I make the switch to new shampoo or conditioner? For me, the last time I did this, it reminded me of growing up. You see, when I was growing up, I used whatever soap and shampoo and conditioner was in the bathroom because it was there. Now, when I got to high school, I started to pay attention to what people said. If someone walked by someone and that person I wanted to have their attention said, I like that smell, you smell really nice. And I'd go up to that person saying, what'd you buy there? And of course it was like Old Spice or something kind of fun. It was never head and shoulders or the things that we really need. It was the other stuff. And so when I was in high school, I started to slowly pay attention to exactly what kind of shampoo and conditioner I can get. And by the time I got to college on a thin budget, what guided my decisions had to be with volume and price. Now, as an adult, I started to realize that there were quite a few more options to, sh to shampoo and conditioner than I ever really understood. <clears throat> what I didn't know was how many options there were in the regards to how many I had chosen in the past. In the past, it was, do I get the same one or one that looks like the same one, the red bottle or the blue and white bottle or whatever it may be. But the last time I went down the health and beauty aisle, I was kind of overwhelmed by that huge menagerie of all those soaps and shampoos that were there that seemed to be mixed in with these other beauty products I had no idea even existed. Now, have I told you that I live in a household with four other people? Now, going down the beauty aisle means trying to choose not just what I need for myself, but also choosing what the other people in my family needs as well. People who have curly hair, people who have straight hair, people who have dyed hair, people with dry scalps, people with full-bodied hair. There's so many different options, and trying to choose just one shampoo or conditioner quite frankly didn't work. So if you looked at our bathroom, we have a whole litany of shampoos and conditioners. I like the one that says shampoo slash conditioner, because it makes, thank you, it makes my choice so much easier because all I have to do is just find that one, get the biggest volume I can at Costco or something, and be done with it. But eventually, I'd have to go back and find a new shampoo or conditioner. Now, why in the world would I be talking about that at the start of Advent? Well, regardless of how many soaps, shampoos, or conditioners we may find wherever we go, wherever your preference is, the truth is they all have the same purpose, don't they? No matter how pretty it is, no matter what the label may look like, no matter how fantastic the advertisement is, no matter what shape it is, even no matter what the price is. At the very core of what a shampoo and conditioner does, it washes your head. At the end of the day, you want it to do the same thing. How you interact with it, how it makes you feel coming out of the shower, that's different. But at the core of it, we need to do one simple thing. I'm going to get back to this point of my shampoo and conditioner in just a little bit, so store that in the back of your mind for just a few minutes. Because here we are, December the 1st, in the season of Advent. It's this wonderful time where you hear the pastor stand up and say, it's a season of waiting and anticipation as we celebrate the birth of Jesus, which is fantastic. Now the hard part is, for us as pastors, and as for us as we create church services every year, is how do we bring something fresh to this season, something that's fresh, but not so fresh that we don't recognize the sacredness in this season, because we all have traditions and things that we draw from. So what we're going to be doing this year, which I'm so excited, is we're going to take this Advent wreath here, 
hope, joy, love, peace, and the Christ candle. And we're going to use these five themes as the primer for us beginning to unpack the various names of God. Now, the truth is, I can't preach about all the names of God because there are so many different ways that we can communicate and call upon God's name. But what we're going to do in the next four or five weeks here is we're going to focus it on just a handful of names. And my hope and prayer is this. My hope and prayer is that as we begin to understand the historical and biblical context of just a handful of names each Sunday, and today we're going to start with hope, is that you begin to find new excitement about how we can communicate with God just as God calls each one of our names. So today we're going to begin with the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Tespoa. Now, Yahweh Tespoa, or the Lord of hosts, occurs more than 240 times in the Old Testament, or what's also called the Hebrew Scriptures. And when we pray to the Lord of hosts, we remind ourselves that all of creation even in its current state and condition, is under God's rule and reign. So before I go any further, let's pray to the Lord of hosts together, shall we? Loving and gracious God, Yahweh Tespoa, we come before you knowing that you are God, Lord of all creation. Nothing here in all of your creation is without your knowledge, your movement, and we are all each your beloved. So loving God, Lord of hosts, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts give you glory. As we begin to unpack this first theme of hope and study just a few names that we can call you, a few titles that we have for you, O Lord, we know that no one title completely says who you are, God. Yet, in the perfect timing, in the perfect place, Lord, knowing what names we can call you, what titles we can refer to you as, how we can connect with you, Lord, can provide such a sacred moment that we can have the hope that we so desperately desire. So may you be glorified in all that we do this morning, for you are worthy. Amen. One of the most famous names for God is Alpha and the Omega. Revelation 1.8 says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I find that there's both comfort and hope in understanding that we worship Jesus who is present at the beginning of creation just as Christ will be present at the time of fulfillment of all the scriptures. Now, of course, Alpha and Omega is the Greek alphabet, right? So it's the first and the last. But understanding God simply as the first and the last would put God in a box that would be a bit unfair. Because when we say Alpha and Omega, what we're really doing is we're acknowledging that God is the God of the first and the last and all that is in between. And what's wonderful about that is when we pray to God, The God who is the God of the beginning and the end, we're saying that our stories, our lives, are interwoven with each part of each new creation day that God has done. Revelation 22, 12 through 13 says this, Lord, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and end, first and last. You are the source of all life and fulfillment of all desire. You made the world from nothing and then remade it through your love. Help me to be so rooted in you that I never lose heart. May every beginning be a hope for the world. So let's begin to unpack what Jim read to us this morning, starting in Isaiah chapter 11. The prophet Isaiah paints a prophetic picture of growth coming out of the roots of the stump of Jesse. Before we can go any further, we have to figure out who this guy Jesse is. Jesse is the father of David, and David was the shepherd whom we probably heard about growing up in Sunday school, the guy who defeated Goliath on his way to becoming the second king of Israel in their history. King David is without a doubt one of the greatest kings in all of Israel's history. And one name of God that's often attributed to Jesus is the son of David. Now, I was writing this and I couldn't help myself but realize I I never use son of David when I start prayers. I just don't. But in order to fully understand the magnitude of the names of God, sometimes I think it's helpful to add things to the things that we can pray for. So to say the Son of God in our everyday language, according to Spangler says this, it says that we acknowledge that David was the very heart of God. So it may not be surprising in reference to Jesus that the New Testament both begins and ends with references to Jesus as the son or offspring of David. He's the one who fulfilled the promise of the coming king, so beloved by God that his throne will endure forever. Now David, and Jesus were both born in Bethlehem. In the Old Testament, Bethlehem is also known as the city of David. 
One of David's greatest accomplishments was that he established the kingdom of Israel by defeating their enemies and uniting all of God's people. Using the name Son of David is to pray for the king that the Hebrew people had been waiting for and praying for for generations after generations. Spangler wrote this, she says, The Gospels refer to Jesus as a son of David. And this reference is found 15 times, nine of which are found in the Gospel of Matthew. And many of the Jewish people at this time of Jesus believed that the Messiah would be a direct descendant of the great King David, whom God described as, as a man after his own heart. Now, Anne Spangler is this great author. She wrote these two devotional books called The Names of God and Praying the Names of Jesus, which I've been using in this Advent season as I start, and they inform my series here. So when you hear me say Spangler, that's who I'm referring to. The shoot or the branch of the prophet Isaiah would later then be referred to as Messiah. And starting in verse 2 of Isaiah chapter 11, the prophet weaves a story of the Messiah king who would be unlike any before him. One of my favorite theologians, Beverly Gaventa, said that what this means for us is that he will govern the land with the right combination of the concern for the needy, intolerance about the way that we can abuse the legal system, and ruthlessness with people who choose to abuse them. Gaventa continues by writing, he will achieve what he achieves not because of his in inane, in um, innate insight or spirituality, but because Yahweh's spirit will rest upon him. Moving on to the Gospel of Matthew, we continue the story of the Hebrew people who are waiting to hear the name of the shoot of Jesse. For all these generations, they were waiting to find out who the shoot of Jesse is, and here John the Baptist emerges from the wilderness, pointing the way to his cousin, the Messiah. And Jesus fulfills the prophecy, which began in the Old Testament and now continues here. And the Gospel of Matthew is kind of funny because Matthew borrows a lot of his quotes from Mark, who borrows a lot of his quotes from Isaiah. So Matthew quotes Mark quoting Isaiah chapter 40, saying, The voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So those are a few fun names that we can understand as the names of God. But the one that the choir sang is probably my favorite under this theme of hope, which is Emmanuel. Emmanuel can be found twice in the Hebrew scriptures and just once in the New Testament. The very first time we can find the name Emmanuel appears in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. As a part of a prophetic word that Isaiah spoke to King Ahaz of Judah, which was a southern kingdom at the time, at a time when Syria and Israel, the northern kingdom, had formed a coalition against Assyria. So, meaning, I'm going to translate this. In a time when war was happening surrounding the entire nation, when all hope seemed lost, God revealed God's name. And up until this moment, God's name was so sacred, it was Yahweh. But when God says, I am Emmanuel, God with us, that said something vastly different when they were surrounded by their enemies. So Emmanuel literally means, with us is God. But here the Gospel of Matthew puts it, God with us. According to Spangler, when our sins made it impossible for us to come to him, God took the outrageous step of coming to us, of making himself susceptible to sorrow, familiar with temptation, and vulnerable to sin's disruptive power in order to cancel its claim. In Jesus, we see how extreme God's love truly is. And we are called to remember this the next time we are discouraged or feel abandoned or too timid to undertake a new endeavor. For Jesus is always Emmanuel, God with us. Do you remember how I started my sermon here talking about shopping down the aisles, trying to find the shampoo and conditioner? There are a ton of options that we can use for shampoos and conditioners. And the truth is, there are many options because many of us need different things in different times of our life. Depending on where you are in life, whatever your needs are, whatever you're looking for, the right shampoo can make all the difference to start your day off right. The people in Isaiah's time were looking for the shoot or the branch of Jesse. If hope is faith holding its hand out in the dark, what are we looking for and hoping for this Advent season? When we pray and come to worship the Alpha and the Omega, just as our lives and stories are intertwined with every letter in between, we also worship the Son of David, and our hope is manifest in Jesus the Christ. Friends, I love that there are many different names of God because the beauty is, is there are moments when your entire life 
You can use the exact same name for God, and it does everything you need. And there are moments when a new name for God that we discover or we interact with someone else around us can bring God to light in such a new and powerful way. It's as if we're meeting God again for the first time. We're to continue this sermon series throughout this week with love, joy, peace, and as, of course, the Christ candle. And as we unpack each week, my prayer is that you hold on to, grasp on to at least one new name in praying to God. Maybe it's Son of David, knowing that Jesus was the fulfillment of Scripture throughout all of time. Maybe it's Emmanuel, and just that simple phrase of knowing that God is with us. Maybe it's the Lord of hosts, in whatever challenge you may be facing in life, knowing that we worship a God who is Lord over all. Whatever and however you call God's name, Let's always remember that God hears our prayers. Amen.